Hi there, in today's video we're going to be learning about boundary layers and matched asymptotic expansions and how we can use them to solve differential equations. So in this example here we've got a differential equation with a small parameter epsilon on the left there in front of the d2y by dx squared term. And when I say small, I mean it's a lower order of magnitude than 1, so a tenth or a hundredth or something like that. And we've also got two boundary conditions to go with it. Now, because epsilon is small, the first term in our equation should be small, so can we just ignore it? Well, if we do that and drop the first term completely, we're left with a first order differential equation so we won't be able to satisfy both boundary conditions. We'll only be able to meet one of them. So we can't just ignore the first term, we'll have to include it somehow. And the way we'll try to do that is assume that because epsilon is small, the first term is small everywhere except for a small region of the solution, where d2y by dx squared is very big, and so the first term becomes significant and we call that region the boundary layer. Now, I've explained a lot very quickly there, so before we solve the problem, here's a quick visual explanation that should help it make sense. So we want to find one solution for most of the domain, something like this blue line here, which is smooth and well-behaved. And then somewhere we want to find a boundary layer, usually on one of the two edges of the domain, but sometimes it can be inside it, and that's this orange section here. And we want to find another solution that applies in the boundary layer, usually one which changes very quickly, like this red line here. And we call the red line the inner solution, because it's in the boundary layer, and the blue line is the outer solution. And then finally, we want to add them together somehow, to get something like this green line, which is our solution to the problem. So let's start by finding the outer solution, and we said that for this step we're going to ignore the epsilon term, and if we do that we have a first order DE that we can solve, and our outer solution, which we'll call Y out, is A times E to the minus X, where A is some constant. But since we don't know where the boundary layer is yet, we don't know which one of the two boundary conditions we need to use to find A. So we'll leave that for now, and move our focus to the inner solution. And the first step for that is to rescale x to a new variable, which we'll call big X, in the boundary layer. And for that we'll use this scaling x equals x0, the location of the boundary layer, plus epsilon to the alpha times big X. So here the scaling is epsilon to some power alpha, which we need to find, and you can think of that as the width of the boundary layer. Now, to make use of our new scaling, we can figure out what d by d big X is in terms of d by d little x, and we'll also introduce a new function big Y in terms of big X, just so it's nice and clear which variables we're dealing with. This step might seem a little strange and not very intuitive, but you use this exact method in every problem like this that you solve, so you quickly get used to it. So when we substitute our new variables into the equation, we get these epsilon to the minus alphas appearing. And what we want to do now is try to find what's called a dominant balance between two terms. So we need to choose alpha such that there are two terms which are the same size, or balanced, and the remaining term is smaller than those two, hence the dominant part. Now we know that the first term must be one of the two in our dominant balance, since we ignored it in the outer solution. So let's try balancing the first and last terms. And for that to work, they need to have the same power of epsilon, which means that 1 minus 2 alpha equals 0. So alpha is a half. But if we put that in, 
the other term now contains an epsilon to the minus a half. And since epsilon is small, epsilon to the minus a half is big. So this term is bigger than the other two, and this hasn't worked. So instead, let's try balancing the first two terms. And for that, we need 1 minus 2 alpha equals minus alpha. So alpha is 1. So we can substitute that back in, multiply by epsilon, and we can see that this time the other term is smaller than the two balanced ones. So that's worked. Great. We'll just fix the scaling equation now that we know alpha, and our next step is to actually solve this equation. So once again, we're going to ignore the epsilon term because it's smaller than the others, but crucially, that is a different term to the one we ignored earlier, because by rescaling the variables, we've managed to move the epsilon from one term to another. So we can go ahead and solve this equation now, and because it's a second order DE, we have two constants that we need to find. But to do that, we first have to figure out where the boundary layer is, so we know which of our two boundary conditions to use. So let's say we think there's a boundary layer at x0 equals 1. Well, if there is, then as we move into the domain, big X is negative. So that exponential term, e to the minus big X, will get really big, and there's no way we can match this with the outer solution, or meet the boundary condition at x equals 0. So this won't work. So instead, let's try putting the boundary layer by x0 equals 0. And that means our inner solution will need to satisfy the boundary condition at 0. But remember, the boundary condition is in terms of little x, and our function is in terms of big x. So we need to convert the boundary condition so that it's also in terms of big x. And in this case, when little x is 0, big x is also 0, so it's nice and straightforward. And what the boundary condition tells us is that b plus c is 0. So we can plug that in and convert everything back to little x now. And we'll write y in to refer to the inner solution. And notice that this way round, as we move into the domain, x is positive. So the exponential term will decay to 0. So now our inner solution is well behaved as it leaves the boundary layer, and that means we'll be able to match it to the outer solution. But before we can join our two solutions together, we need to figure out the constant in the outer solution. And now that we know where the boundary layer is, our outer solution is going to meet the boundary condition on the opposite side of the domain, so at x equals 1. And that tells us that a must be equal to e. So we can plug that in too, and we've got our outer solution. And the only thing that's left to do is to join our two solutions together. And the way that we do that is by looking at the values of the functions on both of the boundaries. Now, they both meet one boundary condition, that part's fine, but when we add the two solutions together, we'll be adding the values on each boundary. So that means we'll be adding on these red terms, and we won't satisfy the boundary conditions anymore. So to be able to fix that, we need these two overlap terms to be the same. Then that way we can just subtract one constant, and it'll fix them both at the same time. So here, to be technical, we need the value of the inner solution at 1 to be equal to the outer solution at x equals 0, which means that b must be equal to e. And that's our final constant found, so we've got our exact inner solution. Then the last thing to do is work out our final answer, often called the composite solution. And this is just the inner solution plus the outer one minus the overlap term. So we can work out what that gives us, and then at this stage it's always good to check that the boundary conditions do actually work, and that we haven't made a mistake somewhere in the matching process. And when that's done, we're all finished. I do have a few graphs here though, 
just to help us get a better feel for what we're doing and how the solutions behave. So as you can see, I've plotted the composite solution that we've calculated in blue against the exact actual solution in red. And I've done it for a few different values of epsilon. And I think there's a couple of interesting things to note here. Firstly, the width of the boundary layer where the solution changes very suddenly gets narrower as epsilon gets smaller. And that makes sense because we found that the width of the boundary layer is of order epsilon. And secondly, our approximation gets better as epsilon gets smaller. And that's particularly clear in the bottom right graph there where the error is really small. And that makes sense as well because we've been ignoring terms of order epsilon, assuming that they're too small to matter. So when the terms that we ignore get smaller, our error gets smaller too. Okay, very last thing here, I promise. This is just a brief summary of the method that we've used. So if it's helpful for you to remember the steps or just to have this to refer to when you're solving problems, you've got it here. I hope you found this video helpful. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up and please subscribe if you want to. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.